Good morning. Wow, this, this room is incredibly packed. I think it must be because Venkat isn't speaking. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and this is a talk on parallelism, so maybe next year they can upgrade to parallelism and add two doors instead of using only one. So, um, good morning. My name is uh, Stuart Marks. I work with uh, Java, I work with Oracle on the Java platform. My uh, colleague and Java language architect, uh, Brian Getz, is here in front. I am going to start, uh, start off the talk, give the first half of the talk, and then midway through we're going to switch. Um, I uh, have designated a hashtag for questions and comments. Uh, it is hash DevOps parallel. So if you tweet with that hashtag, we will see it. I uh, can't promise that we'll get to every question in this session, but uh, we'll try to follow up afterwards if there are ones that are not answered in, in this session. All right, this talk is thinking in parallel, but I don't want us to immediately start thinking that way. I, think, I believe that the best way to think about parallelism is not to think about parallelism. Instead, we should be thinking about the fundamental properties of the code. We should think about the problem that we are trying to solve and not about how to implement that problem. For decades, we've learned how to program using specific styles, and that has really influenced well, more than influence, it has colored our thinking into particular ways of implementation, and that is working against us. So what I'm going to do in my segment of the talk is illustrate this with two trivial examples. And I'm going to go into fairly deep dive analysis of those examples. So this is the first trivial example. Convert an array of strings to uppercase. And I'm going to show this implemented two ways. The first is using a conventional or an iterative approach, and the second using streams or an aggregate approach. All right, so here's the iterative approach. It's, it's pretty simple, right? We get an input array, we allocate an array for the result, and then we have a for loop that runs over the indexes from zero to the length and assigns the output result by calling uppercase to uppercase on on each element of the input and returns the result. This is, I mean, it's really simple. So let's look what happens when this executes. So this is our input array along the top. We have the letters A, B, C, D, and E. And then it converts the first one to uppercase, then the second, then the third, fourth, and fifth. So uh, pretty obvious. I think everybody can intuitively understands this, but I think it's important to look at it at this level because there's actually a lot of stuff going on here. So what I want to do is tease apart some of the issues that are going on in the code. So we have a for loop, and the notion of the for loop is we want to operate on every element of the array. But it doesn't say that exactly. What we do is we have to set the indexes and the boundaries, and then we have to increment the index each time. And so that's sort of mixed in with this notion of, of operate on every element of the array. Now, with this for loop, the actual computation is sort of, it's, it's, it's buried in the middle there. So this, this we're, we're familiar enough with this idiom to say, oh yeah, we're uppercasing every element of the array. But that's, that's only because we're so used to it. If there were a subtle problem with the index computations or something, or the boundaries were off, then we might think it says, operate on every element of the array, when in fact it might not be. So we've, we've th there are these little details that, oh, I'm talking about my next slide here. There are these little details that are obscuring what we're, we're go what's going on. So if we, <coughs> if we look at what a for loop is doing, it is inherently sequential, and it is also, in the typical idiomatic fashion, it is also processing things only left to right. And those are accidental. They are not essential. They're not inherent to the problem that we're trying to solve. Remember, I said convert every element to the array to uppercase. There's nothing that says it has to be done one at a time. There's nothing in that problem statement that says that it has to be done left to right. Yet, that's the way we wrote the loop, because, simply because we've been doing that for years and years and years. That's the way we all learn to program. And so, yeah, well, what other way can you do it? So there's an observation here that's not in the code, which is that the computation of every string being converted to uppercase is independent of every other 
similar computation. So that's not particularly important for this example, but I think you should remember that. Each computation is independent of all the others. Now, Java has an enhanced for loop that says a little bit more precisely that we want to operate on every element and array of a collection, but it doesn't help all that much. All right, so let's move on to the streams example. So here we say we take our input array, convert it to a stream, and then we map each element to uppercase and send the result to an output array and return that. So notice, this doesn't say left to right. This, this doesn't say things are done in any particular order. Because of the way we've implemented this, this, is impl this, is, this will run sequentially. It won't run in parallel. So if we look at our input array and how the output array is created, we don't care about the ordering in, in which these operations are done or anything like that. In fact, a better way to think about this is to say this is not an operation on each individual element. It's an operation on the entire array as an aggregate, not one at a time. All right, a couple trivial examples. What do we think about them? So we can look at the streams version and say, oh, yes, the streams version is better. It's more compact. It's new and cool. It's more functional. Functional programming is good. We like that. So that's why the streams version is better. Or we can say, well, a for loop is better because you know, the streams have some overhead. So a for loop is more efficient. The JIT can optimize it better. It's more familiar. So we can understand it more easily. So if you're unfamiliar with streams in Lambda, then the streams code is, is not better. And the for loop is straightforward, especially for such a simple computation. So I claim this is wrong. Every individual statement is, is correct. You can argue about various subjective things about those. But I think this is the wrong way to compare those pieces of code, because it's really focusing on, on all these little details. Instead, our claim is that the streams version is better, not because it's new and cool or it's com, uh, concise or uses Lambda or functional programming, but because it's operating at a higher level of abstraction. So, this notion of the independence of each computation on each array element is expressed much more clearly in the streams code. And that's, that's not true of the, the loop code. There's, there's less accidental complexity. We don't have to worry about loop indexes or incrementing or bounds or off by one errors with the streams code. Implicitly, the stream code is saying we're operating on all the elements, not on individual elements. And so what we can do is this allows us to focus on the problem statement, allows us to focus on the desired results instead of saying, OK, one element at a time, left to right, and so forth. OK, so this is a talk on parallelism. Why hasn't he said anything about parallelism yet? So notice I did not say, oh, the streams code is better because you can parallelize it. Now, you might or might not ever want to run this code in parallel. In fact, that's what Brian's part of the talk is about. But we claim that this code is still better than the, than the for loop code. And in fact, for, for the reasons I just stated, because of the better abstraction, the notion of an aggregate operation, and so forth. That's why the code is better. And as a bonus, the code is better, but also it can be parallelized if we want to. All right, so let's move on to the second example. It's, it's actually pretty trivial, but it's somewhat less trivial than the first one. Uh, it's, the problem statement is splitting a list. Let's say we have a list and we have a predicate that will match certain elements that, meet some, that have some property. And the result should be a list that has sublists where that uh, are, are bounded by the, uh, where the predicate matches. Um, so, uh, so the sublists have been, the sublists is where the, uh, I'm sorry, the original list is split into result sublists. So you can see the example there. We have A, B, hash, C, hash, D, E. So the, the result will be sublists of A, B, and then a sublist of C, and then a sublist of D, E. So the, the predicate is telling us where we need to do the splitting. Okay. So I want to put in a shameless plug for Stack Overflow. Wow. 
That's, that's the biggest and best QR code I've ever seen. So, uh, so this came from a Stack Overflow question. And there's a, there's a backstory here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it. That's a link to it. And the QR code is, a, uh, is, uh, is the link to my answer to the Stack Overflow question. And uh, I recommend you go, uh, go read this at some point after this talk. Uh, um, but it's interesting because that, this is actually very close to the question that was asked on Stack Overflow. And if you look at the other answers, many of them are wrong. Um, many of them have, uh, um, many of them are more complex than they need to be. Even the other answers that are correct are much more complex than, than my solution. Uh, in fact, um, considerably so. So uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, lot of interesting things going on there. Oh, another thing is, too, Brian, uh, Brian and I are both on Stack Overflow, and I'm a few thousand points ahead of him, and I want, I want to stay that way. So <laughs> please go here and upvote this answer. So, but what this tells me is, I said this was a trivial problem, but you know, maybe it isn't so trivial after all, and you, you might not think so, or you might agree after looking at some of those other answers. All right, so let's, let's work through solving this problem. All right, so we have our input array, a, b, hash, c, hash, d, e. Now, you have to know a little bit about the sublist API in Java. A sublist takes the start and end index. It's half open, but it's a little detail. But basically, it takes indexes. So conceptually, what we want to do is number every element of the array. So then... If our predicate is equals to the hash character, then that's where the split points are. So we've, we've, what, what this tells us is that the sublists are between the split points. But then we have these ones at the end. So what we need to do is synthesize edges or split points at each end. And now we have the, the result sublist that we want is between these edges. All right, so we have to do a little bit of thinking, but it's not too bad. But if you look at the indexes, the way you get the, the sublist you want is by starting at the element to, to the right of the split point and then ending at the element at the end because the, the uh, I'm sorry, that's not quite right. But basically, you do the index computations based on the, uh, the edges that were computed by, by where the predicate is on, um, and look at the indexes of the elements where the predicate matches. So anyway, so we get these sublists, and then we, we coalesce them into a list, and that's our result. All right, so let's look at how to solve this um, using a fairly conventional iterative approach. Um, so, I've, uh, so let's phrase this as a method here called split. It takes an input list of t and a predicate on t. And so I've, I've left off the wild cards, which, which really should be here, but uh, they tend to confuse things. Uh, anyway, so given a list of t input, predicate of t, we want the result to be a list of list of t. And those are the sublists. Okay, so let's start off. Um, we create our result list. So we create an array list of the right type. And, well, let's see. We, we, have, we have the start local variable because, well, if you think through it, we, we need to start somewhere at the left. So we need something that starts at zero. And what we're going to do is we're going to work our way, let's see, from your point of view, from left to right, and build up sublists until we hit something that matches a predicate. And once we get a once we get that sublist, we're going to put that into the result. So we start our for loop with cur being the index of the, of the element we're operating on. And then when we hit an element that matches the predicate, we take the sublist from our start point and the current point and create the sublist and put it into the result and keep going through the loop. And um, I think it's interesting if, convince yourself that this code is correct. Think about that for a while, because there's actually a lot going on. So, so here's kind of the, 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 the meat 
of this algorithm, which is here's where we call the predicate. We're taking the current element and calling the predicate on it, and we're doing we're we're, we're changing some log we're we're basing some logic on the result of that test, and then in the second line I've highlighted here, we are creating the sublist with the right bounds and then inserting that into the result, and then we have all these other other things going on, like we have this index computation. Um, we have the start variable, which I kind of stumbled over explaining because it's sort of hard to explain. It's sort of, now that we know what we're going on, it's the, it's the starting point of the current sublist that we are working on or, or something like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain and that, that's, that's an, an interesting and telling point. So what else? Oh, we had to remember to initialize some state up front. Our loop mechanics are exposed. So we have our usual um, uh, for loop with uh, index variable and increment in the right place. Oh, and then also, well, we had the start variable, which is the, 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 the sublist we're, we're working on. And we had to, when we, when we added a result in, we had to remember to increment that to um, in the right way. And that's easy to get wrong. And then at the end of the for loop, we actually have an open sublist that we also need to put into the result. So we, uh, we need to add that in after the end of the loop. And that's, it's, that's not obvious. Now, it's, it's sort of obvious to me because I've implemented this problem about 10 times. And so you learn a lot from a problem by, by implementing it in different ways 10 times. But it's interesting and telling because like on Stack Overflow, you bang something like this out and you make a few mistakes and you run some units. Oh, I forgot that case. Oh, that's right. Start has to be cur plus one, not cur. Or, oh, gee, I'm missing something. Oh, that's right. After the loop, I guess I have to add, um, uh, add this, this open sublist. So in fact, when I implemented this, I forgot that the first time. And I, fortunately, I had written some unit tests and it caught it. So it's like, oh, yeah, I, I have to do that. And I had to puzzle over it for a while. Why do I have to do that at the end? Oh, yeah, OK. So, so there's a lot going on here. Um, I think I, I covered some of this before. But, but I think the, the main point is the way I set up that diagram with, with a problem where we created the edges by applying the predicate to each element and then deriving the sublist boundaries from the position of those edges, that's almost invisible in that code. There's, there's a lot of clutter around it, the index computations and so forth. Um, so if you didn't have that diagram, Think about what it would, think, think about writing that, or, sorry, suppose somebody else had written that for loop and you were reading it. Think about reconstructing that diagram from the for loop. Um, you might have to pull out a piece of paper and start modeling it and say, oh, I see, it's building up sublists incrementally and the sublists look like this. And, and that's, that's a lot of work. And there's this problem here because there's a, a large conceptual distance between the problem and the way it's expressed in the for loop. Now, there's another thing going on, which is that there is a data dependency between the results of every iteration of the for loop and the previous one. And that's really important, right? Because we're building up state. We started with our result list. We started with this notion of our current open sublist, and we're poking at them continually. So when we're midway through the computation, suppose we decide to do something. All right, so we, we make some change, we create a sublist and add it to the result or something like that. That intermediate result depends on all of the previous calculations. And all of the previous calculations, or each of the previous calculations, depends on all the ones previous to it. So the way we wrote this for loop immediately constrains us into a left to right processing model. And it's extremely hard to break out of it. But notice, if you go back to the original problem, there's no such dependency in the problem statement. We just said split the input list at the places where an element matches the predicate. And if you think about that, you can perform that operation completely independent of all the other computations of the split points. So this for loop has, has done something very strange to our algorithm because we created this data dependency that's based solely on the fact that we decided to use iteration to implement it. All right, so let's re reapply, uh, re-implement this, uh, this problem using streams instead. So what we want to do is avoid iteration, but we are interested in indexes. And so I'm going to use a technique which is 
instead of streaming over the elements of the array, which is a pretty common thing to do, instead I'm going to stream over the indexes into the array, or actually into the list, but I'm treating it like an array. So uh, that's done by calling intStream.range. And again, the, the computation of a, a sublist edge is independent of all the others. So we can apply that predicate at that point, and it has no dependencies on anything that occurs to the left or right. And so you know, think about how different that is from the looping approach. All right, so here's that diagram again. So uh, again, we, we number the elements of the array, and we apply the predicate to, to each one, and that is where our edges occur, and then the sublists are computed based uh, on being between each edge. All right, so our outline is, to, to, to derive this, we have a three-step approach here. So the first is filter the indexes to find the interior sublist edges. So those are, in this case, uh, the edges at two and four. So that's the first step. And then the second step is to synthesize the exterior edges at the end. And then once we have our complete list of edges, compute sublists based on this edge and the next one. All right, so what does that code look like? So we filter the edges, uh, fil filter the indexes to get the, the list of edges. We start off with an in-stream of range over the input, and we filter it by calling a predicate. And notice we're operating on the indexes. So we just take the results of, of filtering, the, sorry, we apply the predicate to the, the element at that location. And then we collect the results, which are a list of indexes into an array. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Now, we ha I'm sorry, we have to do something a little ugly here because in Java, it's hard to, hard to do array manipulation. So in order to add things at each end of the array, what we do is we have to create an array that's too larger, <coughs> copy the original array into the middle, and then stick things at the ends. And so that's kind of painful, but that's, that's exactly what that does. But we're going to clean that up in a minute. All right, and the third step is now that we have an array of the edges, we take each edge except for the last one and map or transform that into a sublist based on where it is and where its neighbor is. And that's what this last range does. Or that's what this last uh, stream pipeline does. All right, so let me go back and clean up this this, um, actually, that was a little too fast. So the problem, the problem is we need to add things at the ends of the array, and that's hard to do in Java. So what I'm going to do is this little trick, which is in the first stream, I'm going to adjust the indexes to be minus 1 and plus 1. And then I'm going to alter the predicate a little so that the ones at the end just fall through. And that, that lets us get rid of this gross uh, array copying in the middle. So anyway, so this is actually the... The, the solution that I ended up uh, posting at uh, Stack Overflow. And in fact, this is se after several, uh, st several evolution steps of that answer. So it took a, took a little while to get to this point, but I think this is, uh, this is a, a really nice answer. All right, so which, uh, which one is better? Well, again, we claim that the streams code is better, not because it's new, cool, more functional, or whatever, uh, but because it's at a higher level of abstraction. In looking at the streams code, we're talking about things like apply the predicate to each element, compute the edge list, derive the sublists from the location of each edge, as opposed to, okay, I'm working on this index here and I need to uh, establish loop invariance and what the, and it's certainly possible to prove things correct using loop invariance, but uh, it's, um, it's difficult for many people and also it's hard to relate that to the original problem statement. Um, an important characteristic is that the streams code treats all of, the, um, all of the computations independently. So again, we have an aggregate operation, apply the predicate to each element of the array instead of stepping through it left to right. And we don't have to worry about uh, very many loop mechanics. So a couple observations about this. This is a useful technique, which is streaming over the indexes instead of streaming over the elements. 
Um, lots of problems can be solved by streaming over elements, and there's a certain class that can't. There's a certain different class of problems that be, can be solved by streaming over the indexes, and so it's, it's another useful trick in, the, uh, in, your, in your bag of tools to apply for streams programming. So if you get into a fight with the streams API, sometimes, sometimes this approach might work. So I, I think we ended up with a much nicer solution with the streams approach, and as a bonus, it can be run in parallel. Now the question is, should you run it in parallel? That's a different question, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian to answer that. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, so as, as Stuart um, you know, showed, there are a lot of problems that can be nicely expressed with streams, and one of, the one of the nice characteristics of the stream library is that it allows for what we call explicit but unobtrusive parallelism. You can make the choice of, do I want this, uh, to do this calculation sequentially or in parallel? It's explicit, but it doesn't really get in the way. You don't have to change the whole rest of, your, uh, of the stream pipeline. So that's a powerful thing. Um, now, one of the things that we've noticed as we've um, you know, looked at what people have done with streams, is that we see that parallelism often gets overused. So what I'm going to talk about is when should you use parallelism with streams? And the answer might be a little bit surprising. So parallelism is about using more resources, more computing resources, more cores, to get to the answer faster. right? And it's important to realize that this is strictly an optimization. You know, if you only have one core, more resources aren't available, you can still compute the answer sequentially and you're going to get the same answer. So if parallelism is just an optimization, then parallelism is only useful if it actually gets to the answer faster. And that isn't always the case. Um, you know, just because we're using more resources doesn't mean that the parallel computation will be faster than the sequential one or even as fast, um, which means that if we want to use this optimization, we have to do what we always do with, uh, with, you know, with performance management. We have to use analysis. We have to use uh, measurement. Um, and it's often an iterative process. Uh, so you know, starting guideline is prefer a sequential implementation to a parallel one. Certainly when you're getting the code working, start with sequential. And then maybe your code is fast enough and you don't need to optimize it. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how to analyze a streams pipeline to see whether there is a chance that parallelism will help you. Uh, surprisingly, you can, if you understand the cost model, you can pretty much look at a parallel stream and get a pretty good prediction of whether you, there's any chance for a speed up or not. Um, so the way we measure the effectiveness of parallelism is what we call speed up. How much faster is the parallel version than the sequential one? And clearly, if the speed up is less than one, you definitely don't want that. Um, you're you know, hoping to get a speed up that is you know, um, large compared to the number of processors you have. You know, if you have eight processors, you'd like to get a speed up of four, five, six, seven, eight, a speed up of 1.2. Uh, with eight processors is not necessarily going to be an efficient use of, uh, use of power or resources, even if it is faster. So uh, the thing to recognize about parallelism is a parallel computation will always do more work than the best sequential implementation. And this should be obvious, right? Because it has to solve the problem, and it's doing extra stuff, dividing the problem up, uh, forking out you know, different bits of the task to different, uh, different threads, decomposing the problem, combining the sub-results. Um, so it, it, it's always going to be more work to do the parallel version. What we're hoping to do is make it up in volume. We're hoping that there will be a, an economy of scale that says once we get a bunch of cores busy and they're all humming on parts of the problem, then we will get a speed up. Um, af after we've paid off the, all the initial setup costs. So in order to actually have that, we need a couple of things. We need a problem that is inherently parallelizable to begin with. We need an implementation that extracts that parallelism. Uh, and you know, as Stuart uh, showed, you know, if you start with the for loop version of the, uh, split, the uh, split the list into, into bits, um, it's going to be very hard to extract the parallelism when you're using techniques that are fundamentally left to right. Uh, you're going to need good runtime support for parallel execution. Fortunately, you get that for free in the form of the fork join framework and the streams library. And finally, most importantly, you need enough data. Uh, if you have a small data set, 
then you're not going to get any parallelism at all because it's way more, it takes way more time to you know, take a list of 10 elements, divide it into two lists, send half of the list over to some other core for processing that has you know, some latency, and then combine the results. It's much faster to just, you know, just operate on the 10 elements in front of you. So uh, you know, I, I see plenty of Stack Overflow posts of, why is this parallel version so slow? It's like, well, they're, they're operating on, 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 on data sets with you know, a few tens or hundreds of elements. There's not enough data there to get parallelism out of it. So I'm going to go through all these factors. Okay, so um, as my running, comp my running problem, I'm going to use a simple problem, adding up the numbers 1 through n. Um, and let's like think about where the data flow dependencies are in this, right? So here's, here's my code. I'm sequentially summing, um, summing an array. So I use a for loop, um, update a mutable accumulator, and return the result. Uh, the data flow graph implied by that is a, a very left branchy one, where the first thing I have to do is add, um, you know, add zero to the first element, and then, then and then and only then can I add the second element, and only then can I add the third element, etc. So that's not the data flow graph we want. What we want is a data flow dependency graph that looks like this. I want to be able to do uh, add the first two in parallel with add the second two, and add the third two, and add the last two, and similarly, um, you know, do that all the way up the tree. So the question is, you know, what kind of code do we want to write to get that pattern, right? So if you look at the sequential version. We've already got a problem in the first line. We've got a mutable accumulator that we're initializing to zero. That is um, generally a, a sign of you know, a uh, sort of a sequential anti-pattern that is going to get in the way of parallelization. So you know, we're used to coding like this because it's so easy. Um, and you know, it, in, if we're running sequentially, it doesn't bite you. But you, know, you start coding like this way, immediately you're going to have trouble with parallelism. So it's something we need to unlearn. So the standard tool for parallel execution is what we call divide and conquer, uh, or, or recursive decomposition. The idea is you solve a big problem by dividing it into two smaller problems. You solve the two smaller problems, hopefully concurrently, and you get a partial result, two partial results, and then you combine the partial results somehow to get the total result. And you can apply this step recursively. When I've, uh, when I've divided my big problem into two smaller subproblems, I can do the same thing again on one of the subproblems and get a smaller subproblem and a smaller subproblem. And eventually, I get to a subproblem that's small enough that it actually makes more sense to do sequentially than to do in parallel. If you're adding up 10 numbers, the fastest way to do it is you know, the version I had on the previous slide, which is just a for loop over them. So eventually, you're going to divide things down into pieces that are small enough that uh, it makes sense to do them sequentially. So you know, this is sort of pseudocode for that. If the problem's already small, then solve it sequentially. Otherwise, uh, divide it in two. Uh, concurrently solve the left and right halves, we get a left and right result, and then we combine them, right? So if our, uh, if our problem is adding up numbers 1 through n, um, you know, what's our combination? Well, we're just going to add together the two sub-results. So we add up the left half, we add up the right half, we have two partial sums, we add those together. Um, addition is associative, so that works. So... Recursive decomposition, divide and conquer, is nice because it's simple. Um, and it's, it's even simpler if the uh, data set you're operating on is already defined by recursion, like a tree. Um, there's no shared mutable state. There's no accumulator. Um, there's only partitioned reading, right? So uh, if I was doing things with, uh, with threads and locks, um, and I you know, had a mutable accumulator, I'd have to have a lock that protects it, and one subtask wants to update that, locks that wall, and then another one has to wait for it. Here what I'm doing is saying, work on the left and right halves independently. Nobody, there's no two threads that are, work, that are accessing the same bit of data which means we don't have to use locks. We can use partitioning. Partitioning is much simpler. You know, I've, if you have a lot of papers to grade, you, know, you, find, you know, call in your grad students and you say, OK, you do this stack, you do this stack, you do that stack, and then you go to lunch, right? So um, it's very simple. Uh, par partitioning is, is something that we, you know, we do every day in the real world, and it's a very efficient um, you know, w way, to, way to do, com to do uh, shared computation. Um, you want to, uh, one of the benefits of this is it starts forking work early, right? If you have 32 processors, you start out 
only the first one is doing anything. You want to get to the point where all the processes are doing work quickly because every cycle you spend setting up the problem is 31 cycles that are going unused in pro by processors that are waiting for work. Uh, the other cool thing about divide, about divide and conquer here is it 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 tends to um, to be self balancing. The the uh, the decomposition is is dynamic. So if you have a small data set, it doesn't decompose at all. Uh, if you have a, a large data set um, and you have but you only have one processor. It doesn't add a lot of overhead. If you have a lot of processors available, um, you know thing, things balance fairly nicely without the code having to think about how many cores do I have, what you know, what size chunks should I divide this into. So the the recursive decomposition code is independent of the number of cores I have to work with, and that's kind of nice. It's a sort of a portable expression of a parallel computation. So um, you know, as an illustration, if I want to sum an array in parallel, so I have an array. Um, obviously, that's a very small array because I couldn't fit a realistic size array on the slide. Um, first thing I'm going to do is divide it into two sections. And I'm going to divide those sections, you know, uh, uh, recursively into more sections. And now the problem that I have to solve is I can, in parallel, add, you know, one plus two. Uh, that should actually be this should be a three plus four typo on the slide. Five plus six, seven plus eight, and. This can, you know, uh, these these operations can occur in parallel. The uh, the the partial results propagate up the uh, the tree, and eventually I get the answer, right? So, all right, let's analyze the performance here. Where would the costs be in doing this in parallel compared to uh, doing it sequentially? Well, I have to split my input set. That might have a cost. Um, I have to uh, dispatch work to different processors. Uh, so there's a handoff there. That might have some cost. Uh, I can do a fair amount of work in the time it takes to hand off uh, data to another thread. When, uh, when the two subtasks are finished, I have to combine their partial results. That might have a cost. Um, and, it depends on, and, and these costs depend on what your problem is and what your data set looks like. Um, a significant aspect of cost, and this is sort of like the, you know, the, the elephant in the room, uh, it's invisible in the code, but it's very real, is data locality. Uh, what you want is for each, um, each task to be working on data that is located uh, near each other in memory, so that when you go and access the first element, the second, third, fourth elements are already you know, hot in cache, and that, you know, um, you know, that, that task can spend its time, that, that core can spend its time doing computation and not waiting for data to come back from memory. So each of these are factors that can steal away performance when we try to go parallel. Um, and you know, uh, it, it, like I said, we always start out behind when we parallelize, and we're hoping to make it up in volume. So we need a lot of data in order to make that work. So that's you know general about any parallel computation. How does this apply to streams? So streams is about you can think of it as possibly parallel aggregate operations on data sets. Um, now, streams are pretty efficient in the way they deal with computation. If you have a stream that's, let's say, filter map reduce, uh, it's going to fuse these operations into a single pass on the data, either a single sequential pass or a single parallel pass. Um, it's easy to say do it in parallelism, do it in parallel, but streams aren't magic parallelism dust. You don't just say make it parallel and your code gets faster. Uh, so it's on us to decide whether parallelism is going to be effective. Um, and so we can ask ourselves some questions. The, uh, the data set, its source, how is it stored? Is it an easily splittable source or is it an expensive operation to split a source? Similarly, the problem that we're solving has a combination step. Is that an expensive step or a cheap step? Adding two numbers together is cheap. Concatenating two arrays might be expensive. Um, and what kind of locality does the layout of data in memory afford to the computation? Uh, if I'm just adding up numbers in an array, I'm going to get great locality. If I'm doing graph traversal, I'm going to be doing a lot of indirections, and I'm going to be spending a lot of time fetching stuff out of the cache. So you have a much better chance of getting a speed up with an array-based source than, um, than with, with a sort of a, a more pointer-rich uh, pointer source. A pretty simple model that goes a long way for estimating parallel performance is what we call the NQ model. Uh, it basically has two parameters, and they're both pretty simple. N is how much data have I got? 
I'm doing the same thing to every data element. So how many elements am I doing the thing to? And Q is how much work is it you know, that I'm doing to each element, right? So uh, how much data do I have? How much work am I doing on each element? And as a rule of thumb, NQ needs to be large. Uh, you know, so if you're doing trivial kinds of operations, like adding things together, filter, map, reduce, um, then you, know, you want to have a pretty significant amount of data. Generally, the break-even for array-based operations, like summing arrays and such, is like 10,000 elements. Um, most of the examples you see, both in the documentation and posted on Stack Overflow and such, are very low-Q operations. They're doing trivial amounts of work, which means uh, in order for parallelism to work, you need to have a large data set. Some operations are pretty expensive. You know, if, you, if you're doing um, you know, cryptographic attacks on, uh, you know, on, on message hashes, that's a lot of work per element. That's a high-Q problem. You can get away with less data in that case. But most of the, most of the examples that people show me of why aren't I getting a speed up, they're very low-Q problems. Okay, so let's talk about all of those uh, sources of, um, of slowdown in turn. Uh, we'll start with source splitting. Some sources just split better than others. Uh, and when I say better, uh, I mean the cost of making the split, the evenness of the split, and the predictability of the split. So arrays are great. Arrays split cheaply. Uh, because you, all you have to do is maintain indexes into the array. You don't actually have to copy the data. You just say, this task is operating on elements 100 through 200. And when I want to split it, I say, okay, 100 through 150, 151 through 200. I don't have to copy the data. I can just um, you know, make a little uh, descriptor that has the starting and ending elements. They also split evenly. I always know where the midpoint is. Um, and they uh, split predictably. I always know how big the split is going to be. That enables some optimizations to reduce uh, copying and such like that. Now, the worst possible source is a linked list or something that's like a linked list, right? How do you split a linked list? Well, you can split it into the first and the rest. And then you can split the rest into the first of the rest and the rest of the rests. And you end up with a tree that looks a lot like that first computation uh, uh, diagram where you have this very left-heavy branching. Um, and that's going to give you ter terrible parallelism because you're, you're not going to be able to, uh, you have this data flow dependency that keeps you from being able to do anything in parallel. So um, arrays split great, linked lists split terribly. Um, other sources like hash maps and tree sets are kind of in the middle. Uh, tree sets split reasonably well. They're reasonably well balanced. Uh, they don't have as good locality as arrays do, um, but they, you know, they're they're okay. Um, there's a parallel to this, uh, no pun intended, in um, in the the generators that we use for generating uh, streams. Uh, you can um, use this. Uh, uh, this generator iterate, where, uh, which takes an element and a function you apply repeatedly to it, and that generates a, um, you know, a, a stream of values. So you could uh, generate integers 1 through n by saying, uh, start with 0, my iteration function is add 1 to it. Um, I could also generate the same stream with, with instream.range. Instream.range parallelizes great. Instream.iterate parallelizes terribly because they're basically isomorphic to array versus linked list. I can't compute the third element with iterate until I've already computed the second element. Whereas with range, I don't have to compute the elements. I, I know where the midpoint is anyway, right? So I've seen people say, why doesn't this uh, stream parallelize? And they're using um, instream.iterate as their source. And so they're not getting any, um, the, 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 their source is splitting in a way that makes it very hard to get any parallelism. So this is one of those things where you can just like look at the, the top line of a stream pipeline, say, what's my source? How's the data laid out in memory? How's that going to split? And you should be able to tell immediately whether it's a candidate for parallelism or not. Similarly, uh, locality is a big deal. Um, parallelism only wins if you can actually keep the CPUs busy doing work. If they're just busy waiting for data from the memory subsystem, um, that's not very efficient. We're not getting a gain out of that. Um, on a lot of low-end systems, uh, they're very much memory bandwidth bound. Um, and so uh, if you have an array of primitives, you get great locality out of that. If you have an array of references, 
not such good locality. You get good locality on the references, but then you have to traverse the reference, and you're, um, unless you have some reason to believe that uh, your data is clustered near each other, uh, you're, uh, you're likely to spend a lot of time waiting for cache misses. Um, and to give you an example, you know, here's the, here's the, the diagram, uh, an array of ints, the ints are all really near each other, so caching works for you. You know, you uh, you pull the first one into memory, and they're all you know the next you know uh, you know the, the next bunch are in that cache line waiting, um, and you have we start to traverse the uh, the array, and you have prefetch working for you. Everything's great. In the array of integers, it works much worse, right? Because every time you go to fetch one of those integers, you're doing an indirection, potentially taking a cache miss. Cache miss. So uh, summing up a stream based on an array of ints parallelizes really nicely. Um, summing up uh, an array of integers, you get a horrible parallel speed up or no parallel speed up because <clears throat> the bottleneck is not the computation. Applying more cores uh, doesn't solve the fundamental problem because the fundamental problem is memory bandwidth. Okay. Um, look at another source of uh, an impediment to parallel performance is encounter order. Um, some operations in the stream library are tied to encounter order, which means the order implied by the source. Um, now, some sources don't have an encounter order, like hash set. It doesn't have a defined encounter order, um, and so it doesn't uh, try to impute meaning to it. But if your source is an array or a list, it does have a defined encounter order. And operations like limit or skip or find first are defined in terms of the encounter order. Find first is find me the first one. Um, and that means first going left to right. So this is introducing one of those left to right dependencies that Stuart talked about when you use these methods. And that means you're going to get less exploitable parallelism. Now, sometimes the, there, is it, there is an encounter order, but it's not meaningful for your problem. And only you as the programmer know that. Um, so if you know that I have an ordered source, I'm doing one of these order sensitive operations, but I don't really care about the order. I just want any three elements. I don't necessarily need the first three elements. You can say, make the stream unordered. There's a stream operator called unordered. Um, and then uh, things like limit, instead of giving you the first 10, will give you any 10. And it gets much faster and much more parallelizable. Um, similarly, you can use find any instead of find first um, and uh, <clears throat> get the same benefit. So uh, be careful when you're using stream operations that are, whose semantics are tied to order uh, to encounter order because that introduces a dependency that's going to rob you of potential parallelism. <clears throat> okay. Another big cost uh, that 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 you know that can end up making things not effectively parallelizable is merging. So, you know, for some operations like summing up the integers, the merge operation is really cheap. Just add add the two subresults and you're done. But what if I'm collecting to a set? Now the merge operation is, I've got a left set, I've got a right set, and I want to merge them into a new set. That can be a pretty expensive operation. Um, so expensive, in fact, that like the parallel version might be five or ten times slower than the sequential version. Um, so the operations that involve a lot of copying, merging sets, concatenating strings, you know, up every level of the tree, can really overwhelm the benefit you might get out of parallelism. Um, and so... If you um, take a stream pipeline like this, like take you know, the first n integers and then collect them to a set, and you try to do it in parallel, um, you know, you'll routinely see significant slowdowns because it's just easier and cheaper to sequentially add to an existing set than to merge sets you know, repeatedly. Um, you know, so uh, you know, illustrating that, uh, same thing, you know, I collect each of these guys into a set, and now I have to merge these two sets into another set, and I merge these two sets, and then I take these two big sets, and I merge them. And this last big merge is sequential, because there's only one core left with any work to do. Right? So the cost of doing this in parallel is dominated by merging these two sets that are half the size of the input. So, um, you sh and, but this is something that is a characteristic of your problem. You should be able to look at your code and look at your problem and say, is the merge step expensive or not? Um, and you know, and if it is, then parallelism might not be, uh, you know, might not help there. Now, one of the things that you can do is there are um, some concurrent collectors 
where rather than doing collection by merging, you can say, let's have a big uh, concurrent hash map as my target and just have all the threads fire data into that concurrent data structure. Um, for problems that are amenable to that, uh, to that approach, like, uh, like this, uh, grouping by concurrent and, uh, uh, in the collector's uh, library, that can often break this bottleneck. Uh, but you, know, you should be looking at your problem and saying, what's the cost of my split? What's the cost of my merge? Okay, so any of these factors could conspire to steal away your speed up. Maybe you don't have enough, um, enough data. Maybe you don't have, uh, you're not doing enough work on each element. Uh, maybe you have too many indirections in your data source, um, and so you're spending all your time waiting for data from the memory subsystem instead of doing computation. Maybe the source is expensive to split. Maybe the results are expensive to merge. Um, maybe the semantics of your pipeline use in, you know, uh, encounter order sensitive operations. These are all warning signs that you're not going to parallelize well. So, and th these don't involve any measuring, right? These just involve like understanding your problem and reading your code. So, uh, I mean, it's important to measure, but even before you measure, you should think. And you know, this, this, these are all amenable to thinking, looking at your problem and saying, what reason do I have to believe that I'm going to get parallelism out of this? And you can probably eliminate you know, quite a lot of, uh, of candidates without having to implement and measure and, and, and iterate. So summing up, as Stuart said, streams are cool, and parallelism is also cool. But parallelism is just an optimization, and parallel streams aren't magic. Uh, they're just an easy way to express a parallel computation. So before optimizing, you should recognize that what you're doing is optimizing. And if you're optimizing, you should have performance requirements. You should have performance measurements in place. And you should, before you even start optimizing, you should make sure that your performance isn't already good enough. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see people making with performance is they don't have performance requirements or they're not watching their performance requirements, but they optimize anyway because it's fun. This is like just wasting your employer's money. Uh, maybe you hate your employer, so okay. But you know, this is not doing your job, right? If, if you've written code that is clear and maintainable and meets the requirements, then optimizing is just making work for yourself and probably introducing potential maintenance problems down the road. So before optimizing, make sure you have something that's optimizable, make sure you have performance requirements, make sure you have performance measurements. And if you don't have any of those things, if you don't have performance requirements or measurements, then your code is already fast enough, right? In the absence of requirements, not having performance requirements and measurements is basically saying performance is unimportant. If performance is unimportant, don't optimize. So anyway, um, streams are cool, parallelism are cool, but don't get carried away. Thank you very much, and we can take questions. All right, we have a few questions here. Um, so here's one. Can the JVM decide if the problem can be solved faster in parallel? So I, don't, I, as a programmer, don't have to choose parallel stream or stream. So 40 years of research says no. Uh, th there have been many attempts at auto-parallelizing compilers going back to the Fortran days. And they've largely been failures, except in the cases of toy problems. Um, the compiler doesn't know how much data you have. Uh, and in a language like Java, where um, you know, you tend to code things with using, you know, small methods as units of behavioral abstraction, it's pretty hard for the compiler to be able to see through all the code paths that you might get to and say, yes, I know this is parallelizable, because it doesn't necessarily know uh, what code is actually going to get run on your, on your data. So um, there's been a lot of research in this over many, many years, and nothing suggests that the compiler can make this decision for us. Okay, a uh, couple, uh, couple other questions here. So there was a question about fold, and wouldn't that be better than what better way than indexing over the or, or streaming over the indexes? I think fold is a really useful operation. We don't have it in streams yet, but fold the fold operation has the characteristic that every intermediate result depends on all the previous ones, and that's you know that's the theme of this, right? Mm -hmm. And with the the with the for loop, we stumbled into that, and it wasn't necessary for this problem. And so fold has the same characteristic. Might be a very nice way to program, no question about that. But it it, it creates this dependency where none is necessary. 
Um, there's another question. There's a bunch of there's a little bit of chatter on uh, about this, the sublist problem. What happens at the end? Is there an open sublist, etc.? Um, one thing I didn't do with Stack Overflow because it doesn't kind of fit was I actually wrote a bunch of unit tests and then ran all the solutions, including my own, against those unit tests, and that's how I got my results. But that's not visible on Stack Overflow. So what I think I'm going to do is uh, post those unit tests to uh, to you know, put a gist up or something like that, because they carry, they cover all the edge cases and stuff, and you can see, you can see what, you can, you can see how the algorithms actually work when run against those unit tests. One thing. So, so, you, so oh. for the people who are leaving, um, it's fine, you can leave, but if you could respect the people who have chosen to stay and leave quietly so they can hear what's going on, that'd be great. Do you want to talk about um, units of Q? What are the units? <laughs> what are yeah, the units? you caught me on that. Boy, I tried to get a fast one by you. And so, so the answer is... Well, I didn't read the question. Oh, okay, So, right. so, so Brian question. had the N... <laughs> Brian had this, uh, presented the NQ model, and so N is the number of elements. What is Q, and what are the units of Q? And yeah, and the answer is it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> you know, it could be number of bytecodes, number of instructions, number of lines of code... Um, it, it doesn't really matter. The, 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 the point is you're looking at an operation and saying, how much work am I doing? Am I doing a few instructions worth? Am I doing thousands of instructions worth? Um, for very low Q problems like adding up numbers, um, you know, like, like, like I said, typical rule of thumb is you know, you're looking for like 10,000 elements or more, uh, but, but really it's more of a quantitative description of Am I, do I have a chance of getting parallelism out of this either? And you either need to be doing a lot of work or have a lot of data or some combination of the two. Uh, so here's another question. How do you know if you have cache misses? Um, so you can measure this. Most CPUs have performance counters. Uh, these are harder registers that are readable with tools. Um, there, are, you know, there are lots of tool chains that can read these and correlate them to code, like the, um, the Sun Studio Analyzer tool chain uh, gives you that. The uh, Perfasm tool on uh, Linux uh, can do that. If you're using the uh, JMH uh, microbenchmarking harness, uh, it has a mode where you can have it invoke Perfasm for you and associate um, performance counters with lines of code. Um, you know, so so there, there's lots of ways, you know, if you're serious about it, to get it to get at this data. If you're not serious, then your code's fast enough. So um, so to add to that, I'm, I uh, I think it's interesting. You can write you can write little programs like the um, the um, the int array versus integer array benchmark and and measure the difference in what happens and it's and um, you can use a, a benchmark harness like JMH and it is uh, it produces some fine grained enough results that you can really see the effects of uh, locality and uh, memory latency on even very simple programs so it's it's interesting to I mean so it's a very educational experience to to dig into that um, how much we want to take some questions in the room. We yeah, have, I like, saw a hand over question. here, and I think that's our last yeah. question. Yes. Go ahead, Mario. Uh, you didn't speak about uh, uh, CPU versus, versus I.O. bound uh, task, and I have seen people using uh, uh, parallel stream because they have uh, I.O. bound, and they want to run them in parallel instead of using the future or stuff like that. Is this something that you suggest, or...? Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, we've only talked about um, CPU-bound problems. Uh, people also want to use parallelism for I.O.-bound problems. Is Parallel Streams a good tool for that? Um, and the answer is, it could be in the future. Currently, it's not a great tool. And the reason is, has to do with the splitting heuristics. The splitting heuristics about whether to split or whether to just do the whole, um, you know, to process the whole uh, problem that's in front of us in the current thread is tuned towards the assumption that the problem is CPU bound. Um, now, could we change that? Yes, of course. Could we provide the ability to provide tuning hints that says, this is an I.O. bound problem, this is a CPU bound problem? Yes, we could. Uh, we would like to. What we haven't figured out is what's the right form in which to provide those hints to the stream framework. So we've seen, we've been uh, given a lot of suggestions about how to do this. The obvious place is the parameters to the parallel call, where you're describing the characteristics of the problem. Uh, we've had many suggestions about what to put in there. They've all been bad. Um, 
our own ideas have been bad. So, uh, like I said in my previous talks, it's sometimes it's better to do nothing than to do the wrong thing, and hopefully the right thing will emerge. Uh, there isn't a lot of positive advice from the, uh, the research literature about you know, how to characterize these things either. So uh, we're still working on that problem. It's largely an API design problem. It's not a, it's not a fundamental technical problem. And I think with that, our time's up. So thank right, you very thank much. Thank you very much.